How's everyone doing? Good. I'll have to get used to turning this way. Well, what? I know. <laughs> it's okay. Well, I can look at our online campus too. Well, welcome to our Goodness and Mercy Bible study. I don't know why it feels like a year since I've been here, but it hasn't. So I'm so glad to be here. So glad you guys are here with us and those online, if you will. Um, like and share this so others can be encouraged by tonight's message. Okay, so look at your neighbor. You look really good tonight. <laughs> I'm really glad you're here. <laughs> you guys are so compliant. I love it. <laughs> I was telling the kids earlier, you know we're having pizza after service, and I told them all the toppings, and they were thrilled. It's broccoli, sardines, and Brussels sprouts. Okay? Are y'all excited? No. That's the response I got. No, it's all the good stuff. So be sure to stay after. We're going to eat. We're going to have plenty, so um, you don't want to miss it. Okay, Saturday, ladies. We are having our ladies' brunch at White Oak, so be sure to come out. starts at 10 a.m. Bring a friend. Bring five friends if you want to. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. We're going to eat, of course, and uh, do some crafts. So this will be a lot of fun. It's going to be a beautiful day, so I'm sure we could go out and take a little walk if we want to, so be sure to come out. And then Sunday, what are we doing Sunday? United, United Service. Service, yes, with Greater St. Paul. It's going to be an awesome time, so be sure to be here. 10 a.m., what time? 10 a.m., <laughs> Okay, I won't say the other time. 10 a.m., normal time, we are going to have our service. So it's going to be a whole lot of fun, and we're looking forward to that. Okay, Miss Gail, are you ready? I want to share something with you this evening that, you know, I'm a simple person, so it's going to be simple. That's the way the Lord speaks to me, but hopefully, when I read this this week, it was very profound, very... Um, just a touching story, and I want to challenge you tonight. I want, I want to not only encourage you, but challenge you. I read a story this week, this past week, and it reminded me of a young gentleman that Mike and I actually know. You know, when he, when he was a small boy, when he, you know, a young kid, he began to have an interest in a baseball. And as weeks go by, they would get out in the yard and toss the ball just by their hands and then and then the father realized well we need a glove and they would do that weeks on end you know after you get off work they would toss this baseball and this is a small ball what started out was something very small now remember that this this is just a small thing that I'm sharing but it'll be significant and they would toss this ball and before you knew it they began to play tea he began to play t-ball then he found the interest because his friends played he wanted to play even more so he went on and he went on up to the pitching machine. Then he went to the, the fast pitch. And then he met all these friends and he wanted to play and he wanted to continue to play. And he'd play in the backyard, have friends over. He'd play out in the field. And he just had an interest in baseball. And so before too long, he started playing high school baseball. And then he got into college baseball. And then he got into pro baseball because now he currently plays for the Philadelphia Phillies which is Casey Martin. He used to play for Arkansas Razorbacks. So we know him really well. It's actually Mike's brother Rick's grandson. So I wanted to use that this evening because where he is today, it started out with this right here. It started out with a small baseball in the backyard. Did his family, did his parents have any idea this, this is where this would take him? Probably not. They just thought it was a phase like most kids go through. They want to play for a season or two, and then they're done. But he took it all the way. He took his career all the way because he found, found something in, in, in it that, that was part of his heart that he wanted to be involved in. So I got to thinking about this small baseball. And if you've ever seen these before, if you come to Thrive Church regularly, you've seen them. It's a little four-by-six postcard. And it says, be our guest, come grow with us. So I got to thinking about that because it reminded me of Billy Graham. But when Billy Graham was 16 years old, he, he grew up on a farm. He was just what you call a farm boy. And he had one invite to a revival when he was 16 years old in 1934. 
and the rest is history. Because everybody knows Billy Graham. Millions were saved under his ministry. So what I want to do tonight is I want to challenge you. I know I'm not reading any deep word. I'm not sharing any scripture. But we need to, we need to, I want to challenge you and encourage you. And I'm talking to myself as well. Ask for one of these cards. Ask for some of these cards. Give them out to people. Invite people, whether they can join online or in person. Maybe they can't come to this building, but they can join online or they can come in person. Because when you hand out this card, it could be just like what we think is insignificant, what we think, oh, they'll never come. We'll, we'll never see them. They'll never dart the doors of Thrive Church. If they do, they'll come one time. We might see them Easter. We might see them Christmas, but they won't be faithful. How many times has everybody said that? But I want to challenge you to hand out one of these cards because when you hand that out, they could walk into this building. They could, they could be fed the word. First of all, if they're not saved, they could receive Christ as their personal Savior because of this little four-by-six card. And who knows? They may take an interest in youth ministry. They may take an interest in children's church. They may take an interest in working in a nursery. They may take an interest in just cleaning the church. And but who knows? We don't know who we're talking to. We don't know what these children are be, or God is calling them to do and raising them up to do because of one invite. We don't know when they walk in this house. We may be talking to another Billy Graham. We have no idea. So don't discount people. Don't say that they'll never mount anything or they'll never come back. I challenge you to take some of these cars and begin to hand them out because you'll never know if you're handing one out to a Billy Graham, a Smith, a Smith Wigglesworth, a Joyce Meyer, or whoever, or just somebody that loves the Lord and wants to work First Fridays and home missions. They don't have to be big time on the TV, but somebody that will serve in his kingdom. So before you leave here tonight, or get, get with Miss Erin. She's got them in her office because I took some home. And I want to challenge you to invite people. Amen. Invite people. We could be raising up. We could be discipling and raising up the next Billy Graham. Amen. Invite someone. I'm putting out this challenge. Invite them to come in this house and be fed the word each and every week. Father, we thank you, Lord, and we praise you. Father, such a small token, Lord, but so powerful of like one little gesture, one little invite, just one little hug around the neck, one little meal or lunch that you might take someone out to, one phone call, one text can change a person's life. And Father, this is what Thrive Church is all about, is reaching out and loving the people. That's our pastor's heart. And Father, we just want to... Share the vision with them and go and co-labor with them, Lord, and reach as many souls as we can for your kingdom. And Father, I just ask you, Lord, as Pastor Mark gets ready to come to bring your powerful word, and I know you've given him a great word for this goodness and mercy Bible study. Father, we just ask you to let our hearts be open to receive and our ears be open to hear what you have to say and take it out into this world, into this city, into this community, and use it for your glory. In your wonderful name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. I second that, Gail, absolutely. Let's get us another Billy Graham, amen. All right, I want you to know something tonight that I believe is going to be a wonderful encouragement to you because everybody needs encouragement. Because everybody needs encouragement. Amen. All right, there we go, there we go. Gail, are you going to sit over on this side with Dad so I can look to both and not be... I'm kidding, I'm funning with you. Thanks, Dad, for sitting over there so it's not so weird. I'm just stuck over here the whole time. So I want to tell you something tonight, a little bit about myself. And I don't mean myself like this is about me because it isn't. It, 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 I can't save a gnat. Nothing to do like that. But I want to tell you a little bit about something that the Lord did in my life that I see right here in the Scriptures. And go ahead and turn if you want to. to Luke. Actually, don't if you want to. Go ahead and turn anyway. If you don't want to, want to, whatever. Uh, Luke chapter 24. Turn either way. Swipe. Uh, use your app. Turn your Bible, whatever it may be. To Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24 and verse 44. This is a familiar passage, by the way. We've been here before. Luke chapter 24 and verse 44 is where I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. 
I said, turn there either way. You know, it's funny because preachers today, we're so apologetic for everything in the world. We get up and, you know, have a wonderful time of worship and we'll get up. I, I, I just, if it's okay with you, I want to, you know, speak for just a few minutes. And then it's like we're always apologizing. Folks, what we're sharing in here changes people's lives. What we're doing in here does something that nowhere else can do it. And there's nothing else that can pull off what can be done by the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. There's, nothing more powerful, there's nothing more powerful than this. There's nothing higher than this. There's nothing greater than this. This is infallible. This is incorruptible. This is unchangeable. This is immovable. Nations all rise and fall. This never changes. You can build your life on this. Amen? Amen. So we ought to quit milly mousing around and, and apologizing for everything. Say, no, stay with me. Because don't just waste your time tonight. Don't just say, tonight is just another night to check off the box and say, well, let's just go do the thing and, you know, the kids and let's go eat pizza, which that does sound really good, by the way, the pizza, especially the Brussels sprout pizza. Oh, <laughs> Hippies. Um, let's go. <laughs> let's go. Let's go eat some pizza. No, don't do that because you're going to be hungry again. Most of you are going to eat again by 9 o'clock anyway tonight. So that, don't, don't waste your time. Don't waste your time being here. Don't waste your time being online tonight. No, God has something He wants to do for you every time that we assemble in the name of Jesus. There are no throwaway meetings. There's no throwaway meetings. I'm plenty busy not to be here just like everybody else is. And I didn't come in here tonight just to throw something together so you could come in and feel a little better for the week and then go on back and eat again tonight at 9 o'clock in front of the fridge, standing there, you know, oh, I'm hungry again. Are you hungry again? No, I ain't hungry. Well, yeah, no, we're not doing that. Don't waste your time in life. Life is precious and it's quick and it's fast and it's over. Don't waste it. Don't waste our time together tonight. Don't ever waste taking the time. You made the right decision. You're, the, you're smart to say, no matter how busy I am, no matter how much i got going on, and I've, again, we've all got, I'm going to get up in the morning and go to another state, take another exam. And come. I, we, we're all there. But I'm telling you, the Lord, the Bible says that the Lord is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. The Lord rewards the man. The Lord rewards the woman. The Lord rewards the boy or the girl that says, Lord, I need you. I just need you. And I got enough sense to know I need you more than I need anything else. See, that, that, that's how you put God first in life. It's just, it's just an acknowledgement. It's just humility. It's just saying, yeah, I've got all this other going on, and, and, and I do. And, 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 and again, I, I'm the, the poster child for that. But at the end of the day, I know I know where my help comes from. I know where my strength comes from. I don't want to just suck air in life till I fall over dead and have so much regret because I always put the Lord as, as second or tertiary or, or even worse. It was, you know, it's just like everything to do with the Lord's an inconvenience. No, it's not. He's precious, He's, ra he's rare. Everything in these scriptures is precious. Everything in God's Word and God's love for us is precious. And it should be treated with the utmost respect and the utmost awe and the utmost wonder and the utmost human humility possible that we have to say that I, I don't know how to do life without Him. I don't know how. I could not imagine. I could shudder to think waking up in the morning and finding out that God was dead. Well, of course God's not dead. You can't kill Him. He's God. But I couldn't imagine to think that somehow I also woke up in the morning and my salvation was gone. Or somehow, folks, if that's the case, that's it. You, you can live another 120 years on earth and gain massive amounts of wealth and notoriety and fame. And you can, you can have a Falcon 50 and a Citation 10. And I'm going to tell you something. At the, at the end of that 120, it ain't going to have amounted to nothing. So why would you not put first things first? And as a church, we, we can't apologize for the best thing that's ever happened to us. The best thing that ever happened to me was Jesus Christ. The second best thing that ever happened to me was, was Aaron. And you're out of your ever-loving mind if you think I'm going to hide that. 
or I'm going to apologize for that, or I'm going to make that make her subserving it. You know, well, I know not everybody's got you know everybody's got a wife. You know, but everybody's got one that you know they're you know they can't all be good. Well, mine's good. Mine's perfect, and I don't care. And I don't care. Nobody else don't like that. I don't care that doesn't fit anybody else's life. I don't care. Because I have something precious. I have something rare. I have something that matters. And I'm going to tell you something. How much more does God's love for us through the person of Jesus Christ matter? Amen. It matters what He did for us. It matters what He did for me. And I'm going to tell you something tonight. That's why when in my own life, in my own life, I'm going to tell you how I came to understand the power of the Holy Spirit. And I've been talking about the Holy Spirit for weeks now and the fruits of the Spirit. Y'all remember the apple and the lemon last week? Gail, I failed you. I don't have any props tonight. (laughs) You'll be all right. But I want to tell you something. At the end of the 24th chapter, before Jesus ascends, I'm going to remind you, Jesus did not die. Too many Christians act like, like Jesus died. They're like, well, no, he rose from the dead. Yeah, but he didn't, he didn't go back and die. He ascended alive and well. Jesus ascended in bodily form to heaven. If you don't believe me, all right, take Dr. Luke's word for it. He tells us right here, multiple times we see this across the, the Gospels. We'll see this even confirmed in the epistles, that Jesus Christ physically in bodily form ascended before the disciples. He didn't die. They didn't go bury him somewhere after the fact and say, well, it was really cool he rose from the dead, and that's why we have Easter, the Easter bunny. But they went and buried him later because he died again like every other man. No, he didn't. He ascended on high. That's where we get that phrase from because he literally did. He ascended to the right hand of the Father. That's where we see this right here in Luke chapter 24. But right before Jesus does this, he says something. This is after he eats the fish right there by the, the, you know, the, the seaside, essentially. This is where you use other passages and you'll see what they're, where this is happening at. He said, when I was with you, this is verse 44 of chapter 24. He said, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds, opened their minds. Open their minds. If you don't have your mind opened by the power of the Holy Spirit, of God's love for you, you will not understand most anything about life. That's why the Scriptures tell us that most of the world, actually not most, all of the world, all of the world without Christ, it says their minds are darkened. That's why they can't understand anything. That's why you can sit across from someone who's not in Christ, And yes, you are to sit across them in love. You're to sit across from them in in kindness and mercy and grace. Absolutely you are. But that don't mean that you're as crazy as they are. That doesn't mean that you agree with absolute insanity. The Bible says that the world is lost and that the world's thinking is lost. It says that their world, that their mind has been darkened by the God of this world. That their mind has been darkened. Well, folks, if you're in the dark, what does that mean? That means that you're stumbling around. And if there's anything in your path, like an ottoman in the living room when it's dark, what's going to happen? You're going to fall. You're going to hurt yourself. There will be injury caused by walking in the dark. And the Scripture expressly tells us, and and you'll see this in Romans, which is another complementary to this. I'll talk about this sometime later. But in Romans, we're warned the same thing. It says, do not copy the patterns and the customs of this world. And what does that mean? It means they're thinking. Because right after that, Paul will tell us, he says, instead, renew your mind with the washing of the water of the Word. He said, your mind, listen, your mind dictates your life. Your mind dictates where you end up in life. Your greatest problem in life is not your wife. Your greatest problem in life is not your husband. It's not your kids. It's not your job. It's not your boss. Your greatest problem in life, my greatest problem in life, is right here between these ears. That's exactly where my problem actually is. Because if you ever notice in life, and I've done this a thousand times, if I could just get away from him, if I could just get away from her, and then you get away from him, you get away from her, and then you find out six weeks later, now you're with their twin cousin. And like, how does that happen? They don't, you know, they don't even know each other. How does that happen? 
Oh, oh if, I could just, if I could just leave Dallas. If I could just leave Dallas. Uh, these are real examples I've heard. If I could just leave Dallas and I go to San Diego, then my life would be great. And then it's the funniest thing. The person goes to San Diego and they're just as much of whatever they were they didn't want to be before as they were in San Diego. Which, by the way, is a lovely place. I've heard people leave here and go to Dallas. You hear this all the time because of the Lockheed transit route between the two. This is the stop before the motherland. And I've told people before, I spent a lot of time in Dallas myself, actually, and in Houston. I've said, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to be real honest with you. You ain't going to like to hear this, but it's true. If you're a loser here, you're going to be a loser there. If you're a dummy here, you'll be a dummy there. If you're miserable here, you're going to be miserable there. Because wherever you go, there you'll be. Because wherever you go, you're taking this with you. You're taking this, this way of thinking with you. People will do this a lot of times in marriage. They'll do this a lot of times in marriage. They'll say, if I could just get rid of Rhonda. Rhonda is my problem. I've been warned I cannot use church members' actual names and sermons, even though it's examples. I'm sorry, Becky. So as the, as the church has continued to grow, I'm running out of names because I can't think that quick. So I'm like, Rhonda. That's a good name, Rhonda. So hopefully no Rhondas will ever join Thrive Church. So if you're named Rhonda, you can't be here. If I could just get rid of Rhonda, then my life would be better. Folks, I've sat across from these people for years in ministry. For years. I tell you one thing, that Rhonda, she's the problem. I get, you know, boot her to the curb there. Now here's Sally. I'm telling you right now, Sally, mm, 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 what a woman. I'm like, okay. Well, this old chestnut, we've, we've heard this before. And what'll happen? Rhonda becomes Sally. And about six months later, did you know that Sally and Rhonda are actually separated at birth? I swear. No, it's you. It's you. It's always going to be you. It's always going to be me. And I'm going to tell you something. You have to know, then what do you do about you? It's like, what do you do about that then? Because you can't go, life, you can't go through life miserable. I mean, you can. Just go see all the church people on Sundays after lunch and you'll see them. Holy moly. Yeah, you can. You can be miserable. You sure can, by the way. You can live the rest of your life, go to heaven when you die being miserable. That's up to you if you want to. But I don't want to, and I don't think you want to either. How, how, is it, how is it that you can be stable, whether it's San Diego, whether it's Dallas, whether it's Camden, whether, whether it's the continent of Africa, whether it's Panama Canal, whether it doesn't make any difference where you are. How can you just be stable and secure? How can you be just a good dad or just be a good mom or a good husband or a good wife no matter where you actually are? Because I'm going to tell you something. Your kid, somebody is here this tonight. It's probably somebody online. Nobody in this room. But your kids need you to be stable. Your kids need for you to be stable. They don't need to wait until you're finally happy in life and then say, okay, well now mom's happy. Now dad's happy, so now y'all all get happy. Folks, they're 24 years old in therapy at that point. And now you've started an entire lineage that now they have to shake off and work out of their life because you were never stable in yours. Quit putting being happy and strong and stable off for another day. There are people who are counting on me today. There are people who are counting on us today to be who we could be. There are people right now who are going to wake up in the morning that you have no idea the level of impact that you actually already have on them and you just don't know it. And you can excuse it and I've done it myself. Everything I preach, everything I preach, by the way, I am guilty of ten times. You can't see it, but there's a t-shirt under here that has everything I talk about. I got the t-shirt for it. So I'm just as guilty as you are. But you have to understand something. People are counting on us in life. Our spouses are counting on us. Our children, our grandchildren are counting on us. Our, our fellow church members, our church family, they're counting on us. The members of our community, they are counting on us to be who we could be. But how? Have you ever thought about that? Like, how? Because there's only so many people you can sit across from on a couch and talk for hours a week and days and months and years. And then you find out at the end of it, you're still as nuts as you were when you started. 
There's only, there's, only so many, there's only so many things you can, there's only so many potions you can take in life to have marginal impact. There's only so many experiences that you can experience in life for cathartic things to try to make things better, and it never really changes anything. I've heard people tell me, Mark, this summer we're going on the vacation of a lifetime. I'm like, well, great. I hope you go. That sounds great. Can I go with you? But I hope you don't think when you get back you're going to be any different. When you get back, give it about a week. And then you get the credit card bill from all of it. <laughs> and you're like, oh, Lord, what was I thinking? <laughs> and this is coming from someone that's been on wonderful, like some of the best places you could go to. But I want to tell you something. It doesn't change anything. I've told you before, you can have the best career in the county. And by the way, I pray you do. See, everything I'm talking about is not, like they're not bad things. They're not bad things. I know a lot of preachers make everything good sound bad. Anything enjoyable is bad. If it tastes good, spit it out. If it makes you laugh, it's evil. If you have a good time, you must be sinning. And that's how most of the church actually does act. That's why a lot of people have nothing to do with us. I get it. That's not what I'm saying. I hope you have the best career in the county. I do. I hope you're the top executive. You're the top dog. I hope you're the county judge, the mayor, and the U.S. senator all in one. Good for you. I hope you are. But it ain't going to make any difference if this isn't right. So what do you do with this? How do you change this to where you're actually useful to yourself? How do you change this so every week you're not the one needing prayer? I'm glad the air's running because I knew it would go silent, so at least I can hear something other than crickets. <laughs> I'm just being honest with y'all. I am being honest with y'all. Because I grew up in church, and, I've, I've, and this is not like one church, by the way. It's, you know, it just is everybody. Been in ministry for as long as I can remember. And it's the same people all the time wanting prayer. That do not throw rocks at me yet. I'm not finished with this sentence. If you need prayer, baby, go get it. Go get it twice. Right. I'm the same guy that sends up prayer on Sundays. All the smart people are the ones getting prayer. So I'm not lying to you. No, you need to, you need to come for prayer. You need to flood these altars. Let me finish my point. Let me finish the thought. But if five years into it, you're the same person every week, Listen to me. You're the same person every week with the same battles. I'm I'm not talking about, hey, it's five years into it and, you know, this is something new or this come up or I've had a bad week or I failed my test or my dog died or my my wife bit me. Maybe I got that backwards. But, you know, this, this happened, that happened. I'm not saying that. What I'm talking about is that it's five years into it and you're talking about the same stuff the same way every single day. And then I'm always the person that needs somebody. Y'all pray for me. Y'all pray for me. No, no, I don't need to pray for you. You need to change this. Because if you will change this, you'll change your life. I'm telling y'all the truth. I know I ain't got enough gray hair because I covered most of it up, but I'm going to tell you something. I know a little bit more what I look like. I've been around a little while. I'm going to tell you something. Your mind is your biggest problem. You are your biggest problem. It is not your employer, it's not your wife, it's not your kids, it's not your husband. It, it, it's, it's, it's not the city, it's not the county, it's not the election. Because the same people, I'm just going to be real honest with you, because we're, we're with family, can I be honest tonight? Because the same people that I listened to for 35 years, during the whatever administration, I'm not going to say the name of the administrations, but the same people I had to listen to for that whole time of that administration. It's so bad out there. The economy's so bad. I'm losing money left and right. I ain't ever going to make it. And this is so bad. And I saw on Fox they said this. And I saw on that they said this. And the same people that said that. While I was growing and growing and growing and growing the whole time. Because my mind was made up that God's my source. And that God is my way. Not some man. Not some government. Not, I don't care who's in the White House. You could, elect, you could elect Daffy Duck come November. And this guy right here and this church right here and everything that I've got my hands in that God has blessed me with is going to be just fine. 
But I listened to all that for eight years. Well, he's gonna, they're going to blow America up. It's the worst thing. I'm like, yeah, I don't like him either. So what? And then finally, somebody all like got in. And all of a sudden, it was, oh, happy days are here again. Happy days are here again. The prophets have been fulfilled. And thank you, Jesus, and Shonda Konda. And now we're all going to act like Christians again. And we're going to flood churches everywhere. And America has been saved for about six weeks. And about six weeks later, every single one of them people were just like they were under the other guy. Because they thought he was their problem. And finally, I had to tell some people, and they did not like me anymore. I said, you know what? The biggest problem you got is what's driving around the car with you every day when you go to work. It's you. It's you. If you'll fix you, you won't give a rip who they got. If you'll fix you and how you perceive life and how you stand on God's word, or you don't for that matter, that's up to you, then you will see, like I said Sunday morning, that you will flourish in all seasons. Not just the good ones Fox News tells you were good. I, I, I don't care who... I, I'm, I'm trying so hard not to make everybody mad. <laughs> but at least half of you, I guess. I don't, I, 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 yes, I care. I care who wins in November, but then I don't. I do and I don't. I care, yes, I'm, I'm a patriot. I, I'm in public service. I serve in government. I, I do, I'm with you. I understand I'm not an idiot. But at the same time, I'm like, you know what? God is my source. God is my way maker. God is my, he's my shield. He's my comforter. He's my peace. He's my healer. He's my restorer. And while everybody else has in their mind been convinced that, it, that all that matters to a degree that it shouldn't, it does matter, but, but they, they put that stuff above Jesus. I mean, after elections, you would think like, I mean, I, I confronted people after this. Some of those people don't go to church anymore. I confronted people after the election. I'm like, you act like Jesus died. And for you, for you, he did. Because of this right here. Because of this right here. And you've been miserable ever since. And no matter what happens, it ain't going to change it. Because it's here. It's all here. This is what is determining the course of your life. The Scriptures tell us this repeatedly. Okay, so we say, okay, well, Mark, we've identified the issue. Now, what do I do about it? I'm glad you asked. Jesus said... I've opened the scriptures. He said, I, he, then he, verse 45, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. I hope tonight the Holy Spirit will open your mind to understand the scripture. Because if not, it's just a textbook. It's just apologetics. It's theory. It's theology. It's doctrine. Ain't nothing wrong with ologies and isms. I have entire volumes of systematic theology I've read. I don't know how I did it, but I did. I, I've read entire volumes of systematic theology. I have studied after some of the great theologians and some of the great isms and octrines and doctrines and moctrines and everything you could think of. I want to tell you something. Without the Lord opening your mind, it's just a textbook. There's no power in it. Do you realize right now that we actually have, we actually have atheist teaching in divinity schools? And they actually are pretty good at New Testament survey. The historical knowledge, the historical understanding, the understanding of the Greek, the, the Greek lexicon, they, the Hebrew, they, they actually understand it better than most people who actually believe in God a lot of times. Why? Because that's not hard, folks. This is, this is, the, most, this is the greatest selling book of all time in all history. It's, it's everywhere. So, of course, they could get that. I'm going to tell you something. Just because you understand a few things historically about Jesus doesn't mean you know him. It doesn't mean you understand Him, and it doesn't mean it does anything in your life. There's a vast difference between knowing and truly knowing. He opened their minds to understand the Scriptures, and He said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. Jesus is saying this, by the way, after being raised from the dead, by the way. He's saying... What just happened, I told you was going to happen. But even before I told you that, Jesus, Jesus predicted and foretold His own death multiple times before He went to the cross. Never let, never let some egghead tell you that Jesus died because of a geopolitical assassination 
that Jesus died like, you know, he was basically the JFK or he was the MLK or, you know, he was all the good people that died throughout history trying to change the world. Folks, this isn't, this isn't cold play theology. He's the God of the Bible. He's far above everything else. He said, no one takes my life, I lay it down willingly. And we know that to be true because history, history records multiple times before he's actually crucified, he tells them, he tells them exactly how he's going to die, the manner of death that he's going to die, and then the third day he would rise from the dead. And he did. That's how this ended up being the bestseller of all time. Again, don't let some egghead come along, something new for you and say, well, you know, somebody on TikTok said the other day that you know, Jesus' name was really this and he really is from Africa. And all that. Stop all that goofy mess. Those are all people that are going to die one day and if they die, go to hell, whatever it may be. But I'm going to tell you something. What Jesus said is true. And this Bible, this book right here is true. You can put your faith in it as billions throughout history have. He said, basically, he's re- he, he, is, he is yet again telling them, everything I told you was going to happen, happened. It was also written in this message that will be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem, which is exactly where this happens, where it begins. The church is born. Here's the message. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. Boy, isn't that good? Isn't that good? The first step, to there's, there's two steps to this. The first step to your mind being changed is to repent. That's the first one. He tells you right here. He said, what is the message that has to be proclaimed to the world? He says, there's forgiveness of sins. There's forgiveness of failures. There's, there's an ability to break away from this world. There's an ability to be saved from this world. There's an ability to actually get out of here when you die. There's a, there's a way off this planet, and I'm sorry, it's not Elon Musk, who I like, by the way, but he ain't the way out of here. Because you, you can go die on Mars, you're still going to die, folks. So how do you get out of here? How do you make it off this terra firma? He tells you right here, he says through repentance. That means, and repentance simply means to change one's mind, that you're going this way, and now I'm going to turn around, and I'm going to go this way instead. It is a totally different path in life. Something that's dead is not like anything that's living. They're totally different. So that's the first step, is that is to be born again, to put your faith in Jesus. And I'm going to go ahead and hazard a guess that tonight, if you're here, tonight if you're online, and you're not doing your scratch-off tickets instead, that you're probably a Christian. I'm going to hazard a guess. At least all y'all wait till you leave to do your scratch-off tickets. That was a joke. You Okay. Maybe I, hit clo- Maybe I hit close to home there. So, I'm going to hazard a guess that you are a Christian, that you put your faith in Jesus. Amen. Okay, all right. So that's step one. Good news. You got half of it licked. You're done. It's on step two. It says in verse 49, And now, now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised. What do you mean the Father promised? Did you know that the, Old, that the Old Testament actually is the first time that we see the appearance of the promise of the Holy Spirit? It's not the New Testament. It's not. The first time that we see the appearance of the old, in the Old Testament of the Holy Spirit, you actually see Him. It's not an it, folks. It's a He. We see the appearance of the great, wonderful, powerful Holy Spirit in the book of Genesis. It talks about God's Spirit hovered over the deep. You see Him appear right there at creation. You see the power of God in His Spirit right there. The Holy Spirit is not some New Testament idea. It's alone. It's, it's, it's not something that was created you know, by some denomination you know, in the last hundred years. No, the Holy Spirit of God appears right out the gate in the Old Testament. The first five books of the Bible, you already see the power of the Holy Spirit. You will see the Holy Spirit coming upon men as they prophesy, coming upon Elijah as he called down fire from heaven, coming upon people who were working under the power of God. You will see it through the judges. You will see it through men and women, by the way, and who were served as the judges of Israel. You will see the Holy Spirit come upon them, move through them, and do God's work on the earth. Folks, the Holy Spirit is not some new phenomena hatched by some denomination in the last 150 years. No. 
The Holy Spirit appears way before this book here is ever even written at creation. And he says, my father promised this. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's actually promised in the Old Testament. It's already there. It says, but stay here in the city. Here we go. Until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Everybody say power. power. From, from heaven. heaven. That's number two. That's number two. You will either, there's, there's two types of people in life. I've seen two types of Christians. You will either be overpowered or you will be in power. There's only two. I never, I've never seen a gray area. I've never seen 50-50. I just, I just told you a moment ago, don't be the person that every week needs prayer for the same thing for 10 years. And there's no condemnation for that, by the way. I ain't, I ain't like trying to kick you around or nothing. But I'm trying to slap you in the reality. Like, wait a minute. Do I have to actually be this way? No, you don't. That should be really good news. That should be excitingly good news. But I don't have to be that person that's always in need. Instead, I could be the one out meeting other people's needs. And instead, I could be the one that's able to help other people. There's nothing wrong with having need. We, have, we all have needs throughout the week, every week. We all do. But there is a difference between having a need and still being in the power of the Holy Spirit or instead letting needs overwhelm you. Letting life run you. There's a vast difference between the two. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. Don't act like we don't. I'll give you an example. When you go to somebody to pray for you, do you go, hmm, should I, Lord, should I? Well, I made all the Republicans mad. I might as well. So I'll get the rest of you. When you need prayer, do you go... Do you go to the most miserable, beat down, looking like a bell of hay shot out of a can and Christian you can find to pray for you? Why not? Why not? Or, 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 when you go for prayer, do you go to someone you trust? Well, why do you trust that person? Because you've seen the power of God in their relationship with Him. And you're out of your ever-loving mind if you think I'm going to walk up to somebody that looks like a bell of hay shot out of a cannon that's miserable. I can't ever get right, can't keep it right. You, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But when it comes to my life and my well-being, I'm not putting that in the hands of powerless people. You, why would you do that? You don't do that. I don't do that. No one does that that has any sense. If you go to a... Okay, let's just put it in the natural sense. Okay, let's just use something easy, like a doctor. And I've seen this happen before, by the way. It's actually kind of funny. When you go see a doctor, if that doctor walks in and his clothes are on, you know, half backwards, and his hair's all messed up and greasy, and he ain't shaved in like six weeks, and he looks like a woolly booger, and he talks like he just fell off the back of a turnip truck in the Appalachian Mountains. And he's got nacho cheese from the gas station on his belly, on his shirt. If you have any sense, what are you going to do? Excuse me, Reverend, I'm going to have to go on down here. I would do better at the health unit. Why do you do that? No, when you go to the doctor, you say, Who's the best one y'all got in the country? Who's the best one y'all got in the nation? Why do you do that? You're looking for power. You're looking for confidence. You're looking for someone that knows what they're doing. How do they know what they're doing? Because it's based on truth. Because it's based on experience. Because it's based on power. Don't you just go to anybody for anything. Don't you, don't you put your money in the hands of someone that just because they got some little label after their name, and them and 40,000 other people in the county. Don't you just go, don't be giving your money to people. Don't be putting your health in people's hands. Don't be putting your future in people's hands. You don't have anything you want. If the guy selling you financial products shows up and his car is in a cloud of smoke and burning oil, 
and backfiring. And he's basically Cousin Eddie. Are you going to put your retirement in his hands? No. Likewise in life, if you put your future in the hands of anything but power, life is going to be really hard. And life is going to be very difficult for you. Likewise, you're not supposed to just always go to people who actually believe something. You yourself are supposed to have the power of the Holy Spirit. And where does the Holy Spirit's power come from? It comes from the mighty, unshakable, unbeaten, unconquered kingdom of heaven. I'm going to tell you something. I've been on multiple cruises with my bride. If I see a ship coming up and it's belching smoke and it's flying some flag of some third world country, I'm going to think, oh Lord, if it's in Texas like pirates. But I have seen U.S. ships, I've seen the U.S. Navy, those fleets out in those ports and stuff and in all, on the open ocean, and everybody on that ship goes wild, as we should. America. Why? Because the mightiest nation on earth has showed up. People respect power. People are comforted by power. People have peace when there's power around. I've been in situations before where there were actual physical threats and there were, there were things. It wasn't that long ago, actually. I remember I was in a situation where I was with someone and, and, and you know, someone you didn't want to be with at the moment because there were threats and there were, there were chatters about things going on, a politician. And so what happened? The police were there. And so we made this little trek from one building to another on an election night and there were police with us escorting us. And I was like... If they weren't here, I wouldn't be out here right now. Why? Because there's power there. There's power. I'm going to tell you something, Christian. Do not make the mistake of letting people talk you out of God's power. Do not let the world scoff at you and make fun of you and put their nose down at you for believing in the power of God's Word, for believing in the power of God's promises, for believing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't you ever let anybody make you feel inferior because you believe this Bible, because you believe in the person of Jesus Christ, because when they're all dead and gone and their philosophies are forgotten, and we're all forgotten, you will be reigning with Christ forever, eternity in heaven. So don't you ever, don't you ever let anybody count you out. Don't you ever let anybody make you feel bad about believing in the power of God's Spirit in your life. We are not meant to live powerless on planet Earth. We are not meant to just live life through philosophy or some man's idea or some magic potion or some magic idea. Folks, this isn't magic. This isn't a potion. This is not an incantation. This is the living Word of God that brought fire from heaven, that made the walls of Jericho fall, that parted the Red Sea, that raised Lazarus from the dead, and so many others. This is the Word of the living God that causes blind eyes to see and the deaf to hear and the lame to walk. This is the book that throughout history that despots and dictators have absolutely been terrified of. There's been nothing else that hell, there's been nothing else that Mussolini and Pol Pot were ever afraid of but this right here. Why? Because this that I hold in my hand is the powerful, powerful, powerful word of a powerful living God. I don't care who outlaws it. I don't care if it's in vogue or if it's not. I don't care if the old hags on the view like it or not. I don't care if they like it on CNN. I don't care if they like it on Fox. I couldn't care less. I don't care if the United States ever outlaws it. If they do that, that'll be the end of this country. I ain't worried about it one bit. This will stand forever. Amen. This right here, the Word of the Lord will stand forever. And if I'm going to put my faith in something, if I'm going to put my faith, I'm going to put my faith, first of all, where there's power. I'm going to put my faith in where, wait a minute, you mean to tell me, preacher, that I can believe God, that I can get in this book and find one of the thousand plus promises, there's thousands of them, that great theologians have cataloged for us as believers? 
You mean to tell me there's a promise in there for any situation I may face? Yes. And you mean to tell me that I'm going to have a promise of the written Word of a living God and not stand on that promise? That I'm going to live through things I don't have to live through? That I'm going to endure misery I don't have to endure? That I'm going to be sad, broke, busted, and disgusted in my face as long as a Shetland pony? And that's supposed to be normal to me? No, not for us, the church of the living God. Jesus Christ, my friends, is alive. And He lives within us by the power of His Holy Spirit. And the Bible tells us that He and His Word are one. So when you see it in here, when you see stability in here, when you see salvation in here, when you see resurrection power in here, when you see healing in here, when you see peace of mind in here, when you see provision in here, when you see a way in here, I'm going to tell you something, Christian. When you see the way that God has made for you in the pages of this book, you right there have just licked the devil. You've licked the world. And I don't care where you may start. You may start at the bottom. And you may be may be the voted most likely to succeed, or excuse me, the most likely not to succeed. You may have been voted the most likely to die alone. But let me tell you something: if you will put your faith in the pages of this book, and you will believe for the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, you will be a power-packed Christian going somewhere to happen, and victory will be yours, peace will be yours, stability will be yours, overcoming victory, and then. The name of our Lord is yours. I keep trying to tell y'all there's a vast difference between us and the world. I keep trying to tell y'all that. I was telling y'all about well, I wouldn't tell you, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even hear you. I was thinking in my mind back in 2020 when I handled the COVID response for one of the, the, the nation's largest contractors. I, I helped write, I mean, that's what I did. I, I wrote policy. I, uh, I was in that every day, all day. All the news from all over the world and studying and NIH and CDC. Like, that was my world for months. Aaron, bless her heart, she wanted to, I'm sure, jump out of a window. And I remember on all those calls we were on, all those video calls we were with people all over that we had, I was, we were helping write policy for Germany and all these things. See, I'm not as dumb as it looked. And I remember on all those calls, especially with the little German folks, they would say in their little accents, you know, you know, we're all in this together. And I would remember I'd sit there and finally one day, it's probably because I'm half American, probably the, half, the American enemy got to me. Eventually I sat there, I said, no, we ain't. No, we ain't. I'm not afraid. I'm not alone. I'm not on my own. FEMA and the CDC in the World Health Organization, God bless them, but they're not my source. They're not my buckler. They're not my shield. They're not my defender. They're not my way. They're not my way. Donald J. Trump, God bless them, is not my way. Joseph Biden is not my way. God is my way. The God of the Bible is my way. You can all go down with the economy if you want to. You can all fall over dead if you want to. But I have put my faith and the healer. I have put my faith in not a physician, but the great physician. I have placed my faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I have placed my faith in the God who in the midst of the plagues of Egypt, there was always light in the land of Goshen. I have placed my faith in the God throughout the plagues of Egypt in the middle of when everybody else is losing kids and everybody else is screaming. The Bible talks about the screams at night as a death angel passed because Egypt would not relent in attacking God's people. I read it said that God's people were spared, that God's people were provided for. I've read the Bible. I've seen what He did in the Old Testament. I've seen what He did that when Egypt, who'd been beaten and molested and raped by the Egyptian empire, and they leave Egypt, and God has humbled, God has leveled the Egyptian empire. Let me ask you today, O Egyptian empire, O Pharaoh, where are you? You're dead and gone, aren't you? You're nothing but a few get airports. That's all you are. When God leveled the Egyptian empire for sticking its finger in His eye, they walked out. The Bible says they walked out and there was not one sick nor feeble among them. It says when they walked out, they walked out loaded down with the wealth of Egypt. 
that the Egyptians came to them with their gold and their silver and with their precious jewels and threw it at them and said, here, go, just go, just get out because your God is bigger than ours. Your God is greater than ours. Your God is greater than Pharaoh. See, the people worshipped Pharaoh in Egypt, but there came another one who was higher and he was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm telling you tonight, folks, we are the people of the Bible. We are the people of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are the people not to be messed with by life. We are not the people to be pushed around by life. We are the people instead. The Bible says that we are to rule and reign as kings in life by Christ Jesus. We are the people that have the power. We are the people who have the authority through prayer. We are the people who absolutely have the ability to stop hell in its tracks. Not the government. Not the UN. Not the WHO. Not Facebook. Not YouTube. Not control the or all the not the British Empire. None of those can even come close to the power through the name of Jesus Christ and His Spirit. So I don't care who you are tonight. I don't care what you got going on tonight. I, I believe this. And I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen things that denominations and seminaries tell you can't happen, happen over and over and over and over and over again. I've seen God's power mock man's wisdom. Let me tell you something, folks. You better believe this is real. You better believe this is true, because it is. And whatever you need tonight, whatever you're going to face in the morning, The God of heaven has told you there's power for you. If you don't have power, you're going to cower. Do you know how you don't have power? It's because you cower. You know how you're scared of a bully? Because you put your head down when he comes around. You know what a bully needs? A punch in the mouth. And I'm not saying to go to work in the morning and punch Rhonda in the mouth. Because <laughs> y'all be showing up here Sunday. Well, Reverend, I'm on Thai's payroll now, ain't I? No, you ain't, stupid. I'm in jail. <laughs> you have been armed with power, folks. Power. There is power. Power. Wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. It's far above, folks. It's, there, there's, I'm, not even, I'm done, but I didn't even get... He's far above. Hey, folks, he's far above. You quit cowering to life. You quit cowering to life. Men, you quit cowering to life and lead. Ladies, you quit cowering to life. We are the church. We are the church. We don't serve some rock. We don't serve some philosophy. We don't serve Hare Krishna. You're going to have to get higher than Mr. Moon. He's dead. We don't serve Buddha. We don't serve any of them. We serve a God that's greater than Pharaoh, greater than the president, greater than any concoction of man. And he's here today, and he's here right now to help you. Right now. So tonight, pizza is really great. I'm glad we have pizza. But don't waste your time. Don't waste your time. That ain't Manhattan pizza anyway. It's Domino's. Before you go get that, I'm going to be down here. And Aaron's going to be down here. And Pastor Robbie is going to be down here. And Gail and Mike are going to be down here. And we're going to be able here to pray with you. And I believe that something's going to happen. I don't do thoughts and prayers prayer. I don't do Hallmark card prayers. I don't do be warm and feel to make you feel better. and You know, thinking of you. What did thinking of you ever do? 
How many situations did that ever change? None. Oh, but there is something that will change things. Supernatural, Holy Ghost power. And he is given to the church to help, to aid, to comfort, to give power and strength to his people. And he's here with us tonight. He ain't weird and he ain't spooky and he ain't kooky. Now, people are. I'll give you that. But we've got some of the most normal people in the world right here. Mostly. And so tonight, before you go get your pizza, and I'm going to go ahead and bless it, so you can't go get your pizza. You just line up down this hall right through here. But online, hit that send message button right now. Or hit that I want to contact the church button, actually. And it'll take you right to our website to fill out a form for a prayer request. It's real simple. We'll pray with you. If you're in this building, we're going to line up down here and we're going to pray. Pray with you. And I guarantee you on the authority of God's word that something will happen. Not because I said it, but because his word said it over 2,000 years ago. And he ain't lied yet. He has not lied yet. So now I'm going to ask our team to come on down. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, friends, I'm telling you, do not go get some pizza without getting some power pack prayer first. It's not going to run out, I promise. I promise. So you don't have to even worry about like hedgehogs eating it all. It, it, there's going to be more, I promise. There's plenty in there. We always buy extra. Don't waste your time. You're going to be hungry later anyway. I'm going to bless it. I'm going to do the blessing we dismiss you're going to line up and go just have a ripper one good time that's great but if you need prayer for anything or you just you just want a, a dose of joy just somebody to love you just somebody to help you you know how many times i've had people pray for me and i didn't need you don't have to need nothing to get prayer i've had i just walked up hey would you pray with me people just pray with you i want to get me a dose of the holy ghost i want some joy Some of us would need two doses. But hey, we've had, I get it. Well, that's what it's here for tonight. The great power of our great God. Father, I thank you tonight that you're with us. And you, Lord, you never want to waste our time, and we don't want to waste yours. You're here to help us. You're here to make an eternal difference in even temporal things. Lord, the scripture says that whatever concerns us concerns you also. It's not okay with you. For us just to go home the same way we came, living under the same thing, cowering under the same thing, being depressed about the same thing, worrying about the same thing. It's not okay with you for us to do that because you said that whatever concerns us concerns you. Lord, you're just looking for a way in to bring great and mighty things abundantly above all we could ask or even think according to the power that works in us. That's the power of the Holy Spirit right there, Lord. So, Father, tonight, Lord, we just surrender to you. We humble ourselves before you. And we just ask for your help and believe it. Oh, thank you. This is a room. This is an online campus filled with joy, filled with peace, filled with safety, filled with security. Oh, the eternal security of our God here in heaven. I mean, here on earth and here in heaven hereafter. And we thank you, Lord, for it tonight. Lord, may we be sensible enough tonight, Lord, to come to have a brother, to have a sister to pray with us. A power-packed, faith-filled, loving prayer in the name of Jesus. Father, we bless this meal for those of us in person. We thank you, Lord, for it, Father, all that you've made for us. Lord, you take such good care of us, Lord. We're all even able to get together tonight and eat. It don't even cost nobody nothing. We're just able to get together and eat. What a wonderful time that is. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Would you please rise for the blessing before you get prayer and get your pizza? Don't forget, be here Sunday morning. And also, too, we're going to get a picture for all of you who participated in the cleanup. We're going to get a picture with Alderman Winters. We're going to get all the kids, too, that helped. Don't forget about that. But Sunday morning right here at 10 a.m. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn His face towards you 
and give you His peace. In Jesus' mighty name, God's beloved people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you and go in peace. Come for prayer.